Hey, in our last video, we discussed the history of the rocket, and in this video, we're going to discuss the principles for how rockets work. Now, we have one more video after this one, and we're going to peer into the crystal ball. We're going to take a look at where rocketry is right now and where it's going to be going to next. Now, to start off, when we think of a rocket today, the principles of them aren't really all that much different from the rockets built by the Greeks in 300 BC that we talked about. You take a tube, you put in some stuff that expands really quickly, you force the stuff out the bottom, and you aim the top where you want it to go. Uh, a simple example of a rocket can be as simple as a balloon. When you blow a balloon up, it has a gas that can then be expelled out the bottom of the neck. This pushes air one way and pushes the balloon in the opposite way. To make the jump from balloons to rocketry, we change how the gas is pressurized. Instead of using our breath to blow up the balloon, we use solid chemicals or liquid propellants that often are mixed before burning. This allows us to create pressurized gas so we can thrust out of the rockets. How this all works is based on Newton's laws of motions. Now, if you're watching this video, you probably already have heard of Newton's laws of motion, but you would be surprised how few people can actually put them into practice. Now, Newton and Einstein have caused many a lost nights of studying by university engineering students in the pursuit of this understanding. So we're not gonna get that detailed into it, but these laws are also 300 years old, but they're still driving the principles for the math and physics for rocketry and space propulsion today. Now, Newton's laws are broken down into three distinct laws that he presented back in 1686 in the book, Principia, Mathematica, Philosophy, Naturalis. I think I got that right. The first is a body at rest remains at rest unless acted upon by an outside force and a body in motion stays in motion until it's acted upon by an opposite force. The second is the rate of change in the momentum of a body is proportional to the force acting upon the body and is in the direction of the force. This is our force equals mass times acceleration law. Now the third and final law is that for every action there is an opposite reaction law. Now let's take a closer look at each one of these laws. Now going back to the first law, it is important to understand that rest and motion are opposites. Being at rest indicates a lack of motion. Now in our world, there is nothing that's truly at rest. We sit on the earth, which is spinning around at an incredible speed. We are rotating around the sun at incredible speeds and the sun is revolving around the Milky Way galaxy at incredible speeds, and the Milky Way galaxy is traveling through space at incredible speeds. And for all we know, our space may be part of some larger multiverse that we don't even understand yet. So when we say an object is at rest, we mean in relation to its environment. Now take this ball that I'm holding as an example. If you can keep my hand from moving, we would say that the ball is at rest. But that doesn't mean that forces aren't actively trying to move it. Gravity is trying to pull it down, but my hand is fighting gravity and pushing it up. Now, if the amount of force that my hand exerts is the same as the force that gravity is pulling down with, then we can say the force is equal and the ball remains at rest. Now, gravity is a constant, so the only variable is how much force I'm exerting with my hand. I can lessen that force and the ball begins to accelerate down, or I can increase the force and the ball will accelerate up. Now, rocketry is exactly this balancing act of forces. When a rocket is sitting on the launch pad, we have the balancing forces of gravity and the Earth itself is pushing up on the rocket. Now, when we ignite propellant, it begins to exert its force. When it generates more force than what gravity does, it will lift off the ground. Now, the rocket will continue to fight Earth's gravity the whole time that is near the planet. Now, this is why rockets try to go as fast as they possibly can in as little time as they can. Any lost time is just more force that they have to create just to equal the force from gravity. Now, the amount of force the rocket generates is what we define as thrust. Now, inertia is a tendency of an object at rest to stay at rest and an object in motion to stay in motion. Now, if I take this ball and if I were to push it on a table and the table had no friction on it, in order to bring the ball back to rest, I would have to exert a force equal to the force that I initially pushed it. Now, if I applied more force, the ball would actually start to go the other direction. If I use less force, then it would still travel in the same direction, but it would just travel slower. Now, this discussion of force is a good time to move into Newton's second law of motion. Now, the second law defines a force to be equal to the change in momentum with a change in time. Now, we define momentum to be the mass of an object times its velocity 
or the famous force equals mass times acceleration, or F equals MA equation. Now, to understand this, let's break down those three items further. Now, acceleration is the rate at which the velocity of the mass changes over time. And let's take a cannon as an example. Now, when the gunpowder is lit, an explosion occurs that pushes the cannonball out the front of the barrel. But at the same time, you see the opposite reaction. The cannon itself is actually pushing backwards with the same amount of force as the ball moving forward. The main difference is that the cannon weighs a lot more than the ball. So while it does move backwards, it does so with less acceleration. This is one reason why battleships in World War II were so big. It's also why someone who weighs, say, 100 pounds will be pushed back from a shotgun twice as fast as someone who is 200 pounds. Now, they both feel the same force, but their masses are different. Therefore, they accelerate differently. Now, when we take this principle and we apply it to rockets, we can calculate the force and the amount of thrust easily. Now, we know the pull of gravity and we know the mass of the rocket, and we can determine the velocity the rocket needs to get to in order to achieve a specific order in order to break away from Earth and go into space. Now, we multiply those and we are left with the force that's needed. This tells us exactly what our engines must produce. This is also why we use multi-stage rockets. If we can reduce the mass of the rocket, we can reduce the force required. Now, this leads us to the third law. So Newton's third law of motion simplified states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. With our rocket, we are expelling material out of the nozzle. This causes a force to be exerted in the opposite direction. Now, as long as the pointy end is facing the right way, the rocket goes up. Now, to get the rocket to lift off, we have to generate more force going the opposite way by expelling more mass or at a faster velocity than the force the rocket is exerting on the ground. So a rocket motor can generate more force by either expelling more mass or by expelling it faster. This is why building rocket engines that can expel the lowest amount of material but do it the fastest can be the most efficient. And why different designs and types of propellants are used. Now that we have a good understanding of the basics of Newton's three laws of motions, let's take a look at the systems that make up the rocket. Now the launch system is the main body of the rocket. It is used to deliver the payload section. Now this can be people or a satellite or a weapon, or if you're Elon Musk, it could be your Tesla Roadster. Now, the main body of the rocket has four primary systems. The airframe, the guidance section, the control system, and the propulsion system. Now, the airframe is what makes most rockets look very simple from the outside. It gives it the shape that all the complex systems have to fit inside. But don't fool yourself into thinking that the airframe is an easy part to design. It has an incredibly difficult job of balancing weight and strength. If the airframe was too large or too strong, it could prove to be too heavy, and the rocket might not even be able to generate enough force to lift that much mass. The opposite is also true. If it was not strong enough, the rocket might not be able to support the violent forces being pushed against it by the rocket engines, or the pressure being exerted by the outside dynamic pressure let alone the intense vibrations during launch. Now, most of these airframes are incredibly thin. That Atlas rocket's wall that we're seeing here was less than the thickness of a single dime. Now, the airframe usually doubles as the container for the fuel as well. So if the walls couldn't hold the pressure of the fuel, it would explode. Now, here is a great video from SpaceX where they were testing how much pressure the airframe could hold. This explosion was done on purpose. Now they kept increasing the pressure inside of the airframe until it finally couldn't hold anymore. Now the opposite is also true. When the rocket has no fuel in it, they have to pressurize it because the weight of the airframe could actually cause it to collapse in on itself. These decompression failures happened several times in the past, which is why it's important to carefully unload fuel and yet keep the fuel tanks pressurized if they must abort a launch. Imagine you're sitting on top of a rocket and that thing crumples underneath you. So now if the airframe is the body of the rocket, the guidance system is the brains. It is the portion that tracks where the rocket is, where it's going, and when changes need to happen to get it there. Compared to the rest of the rocket, the guidance system is the smallest section. And as technology gets better and better, the guidance sections become smaller and more accurate. 
Now, your cell phone today, it has more computational power than what was used on the entire Apollo space mission. Now, the incredible improvements in computational speed and accuracy is a major component to how SpaceX can land those rockets. If you want to learn more about that, now click up here. Once the guidance system knows what it needs the rocket to do, it's up to the control system to actually do it. This can be by moving fins or directing the thrust by using gimbals on the engines or using attitude control rockets like these nitrogen cold thrusters that we're seeing on the Falcon 9s. Now, by utilizing these systems, the rocket is able to adjust its course to maintain the direction and the speed that the guidance system is telling it to. Now, the final system is the one that gets all the glory, and that's the propulsion system. Now, this includes all the subsystems that are required to propel the rocket, including the fuel system, the oxidizer, which you need because combustion requires oxygen and there's no oxygen in space like there is here in our atmosphere. And then the pumps to push that fuel into the injectors and the injectors are gonna spray that fuel into the combustion chamber, which is also the nozzle. Now the nozzle actually shapes the exhaust. Now each of these subsystems has designs and trade-offs. Now there is no one best way of doing it. As an example, the nozzle can have different sizes and shapes that give it better performance with different types of fuels and at different altitudes. Now one major decision that has to be made with propulsion systems is using either a liquid propellant or a solid component. Now solid rockets have been around for well over a thousand years but liquid propellants are relatively recent. Now the main reason isn't that rocketeers in the past didn't know how to mix chemicals that would make them burn quickly. The problem was that they couldn't control the speed or the chemicals that would be burned. So they just didn't have the material science or the engineering to develop the types of equipment to do so. Now instead of a nice smooth burning rocket motor, when they mixed their chemicals, it would basically just blow up. So it's also important to understand that just because solid propellants is more historical, it still might be the best for the certain type of task. Now they're light, they don't have to carry all the extra mass of the propulsion control systems and the engines, and that means less mass, thus faster acceleration in order to get the same amount of force. Now this is why you still see many rockets using solid boosters. Now these boosters, the problem with a solid rocket is that once you light them, it's like a firework. They're gonna go. And you really don't have an effective way to stop or control how fast they're gonna burn. So what larger rockets will do is that they will mix the types of rockets. The Space Shuttle was a perfect example of this. Now it used the solid rocket motor boosters on the side to give it its primary thrust and it used the engines on the Space Shuttle to fine tune the thrust generated by the rockets as a whole. They would also break those solid boosters away to reduce the total mass of the rocket when there was no longer used. Now this creates a different type of multi-stage rocket from the ones that we're used to seeing where the bottom will fall away. Now before we end, it's gonna be fun, I want you to look at some rockets that have nothing to do with space or the military and uh, check out a couple of these little clips from some of these teams. I'm going to go ahead and put the links to the, the longer videos down in the description below. Uh, you know, feel free to go watch the full length. Dream engineering and aerodynamic modeling, all with the end goal of breaking the world land speed record. Three, two, one. Well, that's it for today's video. Uh, you know, Newton's three laws of motions are so important to us, whether you wanna fly an airplane, build a race car, or go into space. So take your time, rewatch this video, go out, watch some other videos, tons of them out there. Now, if you get a great understanding of these principles, it's really gonna take you far, especially if you wanna go into aerospace or engineering. Also, if you're a CAP cadet studying for your aerospace dimensions module, this video really has a lot of important details. So go ahead and pause the video at the end. There's gonna be a list of terms that you really need to know in order to do great on your exam, which I know you're gonna do. So I'll see you in video three, where we're gonna be discussing the near future of rockets, designs for space. So that's it. I will uh, see you then. Thanks everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye.